Welcome back, everybody, to the policy panel. We have uh, very distinguished speakers today. Sarah Breeden from the Bank of England, Otto Edenhofer from the MCC and PIK, PIK and Antonius Willem Bergo from the IMF. Let me briefly introduce them. So Sarah Breeden from the Bank of England has, uh, is an executive director and has uh, positions, holds positions that are very closely related to the topic of the conference. She's the executive sponsor of the BOE's uh, work on climate change and the chair of the network for green in the financial system in Workstream 2. And uh, the second speaker is uh, Otmar Edenhofer. Otmar Edenhofer is a very well-known figure, a person in, in climate change, uh, economics of climate change, as the director of the Potsdam Institute of, for Climate Impact and, and Research and director of the Mercator Research Institute on, Clim on Global Commons and Climate Change. The third speaker is Antonio Spilimbergo from the IMF, as a deputy director in the research department. Antonio told me two days ago or three days ago in a brief conversation that he recently moved into climate change, but is very active in the field now and is going to tell us something on the IMF's positions. And we are very happy that uh, Larry Kotlikov took over the role or takes over the role and agreed to take over the role as the moderator of this panel. Larry is, uh, for me, very personally very influential because he's one of the founding fathers of quantitative OLG models, which he now also uses for climate uh, change research. And I think he had, these are the models, types of models and one should probably use more for these type of questions. And so we have, and, and he's also very influential in the policy debate. So he's the perfect person to, to chair such a, such a panel. And uh, so thank you very much for taking this over. And now I directly hand over to Antonio to give the first round of present in the presentation. Alex, thank you very much. This is very nice of you. Thank you very much for this conference. This has been a really, really uh, very nice conference. I will, uh, um, my comments uh, will focus on three topics. First uh, on uh, uh, but no, the first, uh, the context, the COVID-19 crisis, what does it teach us for the climate emergency? Why now? And what is the IMF doing? First, the big context. The big context is that uh, energy uh, here, climate change, dealing with climate change means dealing with a gigantic, important climate energy transition. Previous energy transitions were done over 60, 70 years. This energy transition has to do for less than 30, 20 years. This is the first challenge. The second big challenge is that uh, uh, this energy transition is completely policy driven. We cannot uh, wait as other policy transition, as other energy transition when the relative price of two sources of energy will change. Here we policy, we have decided to do it ex ante because we are worried about the climate implication. So the name of the game is to do faster and policy driven. And uh, what is, uh, why, uh, what does, uh, uh, what did the, the COVID-19 crisis teach us about this and why now it has to be fast and what the IMF is doing. First, the political economy, as I said, this is a policy driven transition. So it's legitimate to ask how the, the various paper we saw have impact on this debate. First, the discount rate. Uh, discount rate, uh, we are used to think that it's difficult to have a, a transition because uh, it's difficult motivating politically because people discount too much the future. Well, we learned that with COVID-19 that even when the danger is next day, tomorrow, people are reluctant to take certain measures. So we have to uh, think that the discount rate may be much higher of what we think for big policy, uh, for this policy action. Second, externalities. We learn that people don't incorporate at all externalities, not distant externalities, but also your next neighbor externality. And this is a problem for, uh, for policy implementation. Third, asymmetry of benefits and costs. 
a number of papers highlight how some countries could even benefit or have some positive effect like Russia, like Canada. And here we, uh, we uh, from COVID-19, we learned that this is very difficult to incorporate in the behavior and of people. Trusting experts. In COVID-19, we learned to trust experts. We had to trust experts. Here, in, uh, uh, in when we talk about climate change, even among experts, as we heard from Bob, there is a, yesterday, there is a, a range of opinion. So even if experts are uh, say something, we live in a period where the, the trusting expert is very low in general with populist uh, uh, politicians. Finally, dealing with uncertainty, politicians and public are incredibly bad in dealing with probability, as we just discussed about having the vaccine or not having the vaccine. And once, uh, uh, given that the, uh, the discussion about climate change is also about uh, climate uh, probabilities, because we don't know exactly some key variable, this will be a challenge. So, and finally, Climate change and COVID-19 is uh, also about incentive for innovation. We learned that given the proper incentive, innovation can come much faster than expected. So this is a mixed bag. On one side, we have a lot of, uh, in, uh, a lot of uh, uh, how to say, uh, challenges and uh, that we discover once again in the, co in the context of a major emergency. But at the same time, we have some positive news. So going to the next, why now? What uh, concretely has COVID changed for climate change? First, uh, even with the reduction of world GDP of 3.5% as we had last year, uh, a severe worldwide, world, worldwide deep recession has, resu has reduced emission by some 5%, which is nothing with, with respect to what we need. So we do need to uh, not only to, we cannot hope just by consuming less energy to solve part of the problem. This is sheerly impossible. Second, public, uh, uh, the COVID-19 experience has sensitized the public opinion to the issue and politician to the issue of climate change. This uh, uh, is something that uh, I, I think is, we should investigate because usually after a big natural catastrophe or technological catastrophe. I'm talking, I'm thinking about Fukushima, about Chernobyl, you have a change in public opinion. So we have to catch this opportunity. Third, key players. By chance, the US, EU have taken strong political decisions to have a green recovery. And Otmar will talk, I understand, on the EU policy. And uh, Fourth, as I mentioned before, science and technology. What is really unprecedented about COVID-19 is that how fast the vaccine was discovered. This is a, a testimony how, how fast, uh, how, under, is, how much we underestimated the ability of technology to respond to a big effort. This is a big call for action now on, uh, on uh, energy, on uh, technology. Finally, uh, skepticism will be always around in the sense that the idea that uh, over time people will realize that uh, what it means climate change and maybe it's, it will be late, but they will uh, realize this is not there. Even in the middle of the pandemic, you have a consistent part of the US population which denied that there was COVID. So we cannot hope, even your president <laughs> for a while. So we cannot hope to have, uh, uh, we cannot hope uh, to have hope that the public opinion will change over time. So all this means that we do need to act now and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, political, it's very important. Finally, a lot of uh, um, recovery plans imply uh, a big expenditure, a big push for infrastructure. While infrastructure now has deep implication for how the recovery would be. A green recovery has to be have based on green infrastructure. We cannot just have a, a big push of infrastructure now and in three years think about uh, a green recovery. 
And uh, uh, this is the reason why we do need uh, uh, a green recovery now. Um, what the IMF is doing? Well, IMF is in three big buckets. One is mitigation, and I will talk shortly, uh, adaptation and transition to low carbon et economy, a connected risk. This third bucket is a transition actually is um, connected to the area of stranded asset, climate stress testing, uh, climate disclosure. This is an important area for the financial markets. I will not talk about this because I think one of the panelists, Sarah, will talk mostly about this. I will talk about this and mitigation and adaptation. Uh, well, we do integrate this in our core business, which is surveillance, lending, capacity development. Here on, uh, uh, on, other, uh, on mitigation, I want to highlight uh, the key conclusion of our research, which is uh, um, showcased in the WIO chapter three of last year. The key issue is that we do need an integrated approach in the sense that our, my take from the literature is that price signal per se is not enough to induce the market to produce, a, a, to, to go toward green energy. You simply because we do not have enough, it's not cheap enough to produce in a green way. So absolutely you have to have also some investment. On top of it, green investment helping this. Green investment will help also to uh, make it more politically palatable. In the sense that if you do green investment, you may uh, you compensate the unavoidable cost in terms of GDP that you have if you just introduce a carbon tax. So our chapter three, uh, our real uh, basically propose an integrative policy where you have both a leg, which is uh, investment, and we propose about 1% of GDP and start at 1% and going down zero after 10 years, and a, a, a carbon tax, which starts low and differentiated by country, starts low at about $6 per ton. 620 depending on the country and rising progressively. With this strategy, uh, we think uh, at least uh, we use this uh, G cube global macro model uh, by McKibbing. We think that it's possible to reach in um, a target of zero um, emission by 2050. As I said, uh, uh, what is very important in this case is political acceptance. And this is the reason why we stress not only investment, but also uh, redistribution, uh, taking care that some segment of the population will be net losers. Uh, finally, um, part of this, uh, not connected to the WIO, but another research has been to calculate the fiscal multiplier uh, of the output multiplier of green investment re with respect uh, of uh, non eco friendly investment. Here I just mentioned a paper by Battini, Fragetta, Melina, and Waldron. Uh, this is uh, the other leg is about mitigation. And uh, uh, our business as an IMF is to deal with uh, uh, global, in how to say, uh, uh, external imbalances uh, and uh, uh, and to think ahead of possible problems and crises. And uh, climate change has a big impact on many of our uh, member countries. And here I highlight a paper by Cantelmo Medina e Papa Iorio on the, uh, on the probability of a natural disaster and the importance of uh, the cost effectiveness of um, spending ex ante rather than ex post to mitigate. This is, uh, um, this is done with the um, uh, DSG model. Finally, um, yes, this is what I mentioned before. They, they do cal calibrate this model and they calculate the cost of ex post uh, 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 eliminate welfare loss against the cost of financing ex ante. This is uh, referring to small open economy. 
Uh, well, I don't, thank you. I just have, uh, so just to, to summarize, I think the COVID-19 crisis teaches us a lot about the political economy of climate change. This is fundamental because it's politically driven uh, change and it has tremendous uh, uh, implication in terms of distribution. It's very challenging because uh, is, uh, uh, there is a lot of uncertainty. And uh, my sense is that uh, this will teach us a lot about how to pose also the climate uh, debate in the future. And, uh, um, and I see this is a great opportunity to, uh, to start. I'm, um, I conclude here. So uh, Sarah, take it away, 15 Brilliant. minutes. Uh, lovely, Larry, thank you so much. What I wanted to do in my comments today was focus on how climate change affects central banks in their policy making role. And I'll leave Otmar to talk about the role of governments as policy makers. And what I'll try and do is cover three things. Firstly, why climate change matters to central bank uh, mandates. It happens to, or happens to have relevance to all of our mandates, and I'll, I'll talk through those. Secondly, I'll talk about what we're doing in the light of, uh, of that relevance. And then thirdly, I wanted to leave with some, uh, leave the audience with some challenges where I think, frankly, the profession can be of great help to us as uh, central bankers. And if there's one thing about climate change, it is that collaboration uh, and bravery is necessary if we are to achieve our goals. So I hope to encourage you to help us on uh, that journey. Um, so let me start with why climate change matters to my mandate. Uh, and it matters, as I said, across all our roles. And that's clear now, even if it were not uh, just five years ago. That's because the physical risks and the transition risks that climate change creates are going to matter for all of our responsibilities. Uh, they matter for our micro prudential responsibilities to ensure the safety and soundness of banks and insurers. They matter for our macro prudential responsibility to ensure the stability of the system. They matter to our responsibility to ensure monetary stability in our role as monetary policy uh, makers as we judge what's happening to the economy and uh, why and the inflationary pressures that brings. And it also matters to how we manage our own balance sheet. We've got not far short of a trillion pounds worth of balance sheet uh, at the moment. And these, uh, these issues matter uh, there too. In consequence, uh, the, your, the LSE's very own Grantham Institute have kind of put out a report on net zero uh, central banking and our treasury, uh, our finance ministry has given us uh, in our FPC, our macro prudential authority, and in our MPC, our monetary policy uh, committee's remit, an obligation to have regard to uh, the transition to net zero uh, and climate change. I'm expecting a similar uh, remit change for uh, our prudential uh, regulation committee, our, our micro prudential regulatory authority, and indeed legislation may yet uh, be headed uh, our way. Uh, all of that matters domestically, but of course, climate change is a global problem that requires global solutions, and so it matters internationally as well. And there's a whole collection of acronyms with a finger in the pie on the international stage in my world thinking about climate change. We have the Central Bank and Supervisors Network for the Greening of the Financial System, which was established just about three and a, three, three and a quarter years ago with eight members and now has 
more than 80, representing two thirds of uh, emissions. Uh, we also have the BCBS active, the Basel Committee uh, on uh, Banking Standards, the Financial Stability Board, the G7, the G20 uh, COP. It is a very crowded space internationally, uh, but at least that's a good thing given it is a global problem. And as I say, that's been a huge change over the last five years. I've been the executive uh, sponsor of all our work at the Bank of England on climate change for coming up for five years. And it is night and day in terms of the difference that uh, that agenda has in terms of focus internally at the bank and uh, around the world. So we approached uh, our uh, responsibilities in the order I went through them, starting with micro prudential, then macro prudential, and are now coming to monetary policy and uh, financial stability, uh, monetary policy and managing our balance sheet. Uh, in many ways, that's uh, obvious and intuitive. It's uh, self-evident if you're the regulator of the Lloyd's insurance market that weather-related events are going to have an impact on the safety and soundness and the uh, uh, financial resilience of those insurers. But what we have done since that first kernel of interest in climate change is build from there to not only care about how climate change affects the insurance risks that uh, bank that insurers write, but also to think about how it matters for banks, how it matters for the stability of the system and uh, monetary policy. As we have done that, and particularly when we've been thinking about the micro and the macro prudential risks that climate change brings, We've been cognizant of the fact that climate change and the risks it brings are different to other types of, of risks. In, uh, let me uh, try and illustrate that for you. The first is that by definition, climate change is a systemic risk. We have one, one climate uh, and uh, the changes to it, whether they are uh, they are the physical risks from climate change or the policy and technology risks that help stop uh, climate change happening, they are going to affect every consumer, every sector, every geography in uh, the economy. The physical risks that we might face are subject to tipping points from which there is uh, no, uh, no return. And both the physical risks and the transition risks are likely to be subject to non-linearities. And that collection of things, their scope and their breadth, means that the risks that climate change brings are likely to be that much greater than other risks that we might care about as central bankers. Uh, the second thing that is really important is that these risks are simultaneously totally foreseeable and yet wholly uncertain. So what I, I can't tell you now exactly what combination of the physical risks from climate change or the transition risks from climate change we're going to see. But what I can say is either we carry on the current emissions pathway and we see physical risks or we change the emissions pathway and we see transition risks. And so it's not a question of whether we face risk, it is which risk we face. And then the final point comes from the physics of this, which is that the size and balance of those future risks are going to be affected by the actions that we take today, many decades before the, their impact is, is clear. If we wait uh, for the physical risk from climate change to be ones we want to reduce, then uh, by definition, it's too late to do so. Climate has got a, a carbon emissions have got a 20 year control lag they're up in the uh, uh, atmosphere it's the tragedy of the horizon as uh, ex-governor carney uh, uh, called it 
And simultaneously, I think it's obvious that the later you leave the transition, the sharper it is going to be. So with that context, we have been intervening uh, with the firms that we uh, supervise and the financial system generally to try and make sure that these risks are well managed. How do we do that? Reporting and risk management. Uh, so we want there to be good information out there about how these risks might uh, materialize. We all know that what gets measured uh, gets managed. Unfortunately, climate change is a risk we see looking forwards, not looking backwards. And three companies with the exact same carbon footprint today can have very different uh, strategies for dealing with them. One could have a plan to get to net zero. One uh, could be completely ignoring the risks and the other doesn't realize it has risk to manage. But when we're thinking about the risk from climate change, it's that forward looking risk that matters. And we need to think not just of fossil fuel producers, but energy users uh, as well. Uh, so there's a, a, a TCFD disclosure framework that we have been working on uh, that is designed to try and shine a light on uh, these risks. So our first interventions as policymakers is to try and get good information out there. However, what we need to do is make sure that risk is forward uh, looking, uh, not just uh, current risks. Secondly, we need to transform uh, risk management. That's at the level of the individual firm, ensuring that they are embedding these risks into how they go about managing uh, their risks, how they think about governance, how they undertake scenario analysis uh, and how they disclose. But we also need to think about it at the level of the system. And so what we have been doing at the Bank of England is considering a forward looking scenario analysis or stress test uh, for short thought that is designed to shine a light on these risks that are currently opaque. Now, that is a really hard exercise. We need granular data. We need granular data that is forward looking. We need to look ahead, not a normal business cycle, uh, but decades. Uh, so we, we have absences of data. We have absences of methodologies and models. We need to think about um, amplification uh, and feedback mechanisms. And all of that means that sizing these risks at the level of the system is both complicated and complex uh, to do. But we're going to have a go. Uh, we will be in the middle of this year launching our climate scenario uh, analysis. We will be taking climate variables, thinking about what that means for the economy as a whole and for the physical and transition uh, financial risks that we've talked about. Thinking about three scenarios, uh, one where we don't uh, make uh, the path to net zero, we carry on our current emissions pathway, uh, and two, where we get to net zero, one in an orderly way, one in a uh, later and therefore disorderly way. We'll be looking ahead uh, 30 years and we'll be doing it bottom up uh, on a granular uh, basis. It's going to be a really tough ask, uh, but I hope that we will be able to shine a light on uh, risks that are otherwise uh, not well seen. And then we are in the early days of thinking about what all this uh, might mean, how we might integrate it into our monetary policy uh, assessments. In general, we take weather as an exogenous factor other than seasonally uh, adjusting it and trying to forecast uh, oil prices, which is every economist's favourite uh, job I know. But what we need to do is try and think about what is the structural change that the economy needs to undergo as we move to net zero? What are the changes to the climate going to mean for spare capacity, uh, for inflation? How should monetary policy try to bring those uh, aspects into uh, its um, uh, its analysis of where we are uh, in our understanding of uh, of the economy. In general, 
we are at the very nascent stages of undertaking uh, that analysis. Although, of course, that might vary if you're a Pacific island, your understanding of the uh, climate is much higher than it is if you are here in uh, the UK. And similarly, if you are a significant uh, producer of fossil fuels, your understanding is much uh, greater. But in general, my sense uh, is that I and my central banking colleagues around uh, the world are at the early stages of trying to build this into our monetary policy analysis. We'll use our learnings from the scenario stress testing that I described earlier. We've been thinking hard about uh, how does climate lead to macro economic outcomes uh, as part of uh, as part of that and we'll bring that learning into uh, this exercise but let me tell you this is really hard stuff and we are looking forward to uh, the help of the profession on that so maybe I'll uh, finish with just some final thoughts as to uh, how the economics profession can help us as central banks do our job better. I am really clear that there is a huge amount of expertise out there about how to take climate impacts and uh, incorporate them into macroeconomic uh, analysis, how to think about different policy outcomes and what that might mean for the distributional effects of, uh, of climate change, the different impacts that it's going to have across our economy. So Larry, maybe I'll finish there with a request for you all to help us on uh, this journey. We have a list on the NGFS website of research questions that we are keen to have people help us answer. And uh, boy, do we need help uh, quickly. Larry, back to you. Well, as, as Dumbledore uh, said, uh, I think it was Dumbledore in uh, Harry Potter, just asked and help will come. So, <laughs> so, uh, thank you. <laughs> come. Admar, let's uh, take it away. Hey, yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I would like to talk about the European Green Deal. It's all about government. And here I would like to explain a little bit what's going on. So in her State of the Union speech, uh, Ursula von der Leyen has announced the Green Deal. And in addition to tightening the European emission reduction target, she promised that uh, the Green Deal consists of a comprehensive uh, uh, revision of the emission trading schemes and all the underlying institutional structures. And this is something which I would like to explain you a little bit more in detail. Now, let me highlight what's at stake. So this is the EU pathway towards a 40% reduction target. This was the pre-European Green Deal target. And what you can see here is basically uh, already here, a relatively uh, severe transformation pathway, but this is even tougher when we take into account the new targets. So by 2030, uh, there should be a reduction instead of 40% to 55%. It is carbon neutrality, net carbon neutrality by 2050. So, and let me highlight a little bit what does this imply? So this implies an acceleration of the power sector decarbonization. Secondly, an acceleration of electrification of all the end users, and then use of bioenergy and synthetic e-fuels to cover residual non-electric fuel demands. And more importantly, and this is the new aspect here, carbon dioxide removal to offset remaining emissions. So it's all about the negative emissions. And this is something which is, uh, from my point of view, a very important addition uh, to the previous uh, to the previous plans. Now, these are the goals. And goals might be important, but what is even more important uh, is the instruments. So I assume that not all of you are really excited to read European and Commission's impact assessment scenarios, but sometimes they are really uh, a very interesting read. 
And here, the first of all, the impact scenarios describes basically an institutional setting which the EU, the Commission, contemplates to implement. And here you can basically characterize these scenarios uh, along two dimensions. First of all, the role of CO2 prices, the, the role of CO2 pricing in the future, and also the role of complementary measures. And as always in politics, if you want to uh, advocate a specific scenarios, you have to create uh, almost irrational or absurd scenarios in order to make a specifically one scenario relatively reasonable. And this is here the mixed scenario, but let me describe that a little bit. First, the first scenario is basically relying primarily on regulation. And this means in the European context that the current European emission trading scheme will, will, will not touch, it will consist of power and industry, uh, intra-EU aviation and navigation. The rest will be done by regulatory measures like energy efficiency policies, renewable policies, and in particular, uh, performance standards in, in the transport sector. This is, this is the regulatory scenario. So basically, in this scenario, uh, the only control the EU has is in the European emissions trading scheme because they can tighten the cap a little bit. All the other policy measures can be announced by the Commission, in the, but, but this is at, uh, in, in particular uh, subject to the national the EU member states, the national governments to implement them. And then again, this is all about uh, the compliance and the incentives uh, 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 to what extent these measures will become operational. So then there's a second scenario. And the second scenario is a quite interesting one. It says basically the emission trading in one way or another should be the main uh, building block for the future EU climate policy. Yeah, basically not just the power sector should be included, but also the road uh, transport sector, the building sector should be included. And, uh, even partially, uh, the agricultural sector. The only difference between this mixed scenario and the sea price scenarios is the role of the complementary measures. In the mixed scenarios, the complementary measures will play an important role where the sea price scenario, basically uh, uh, the EU intends to get rid of all the complementary measures. And uh, if you know the debate within the EU, you immediately realize that the sea price scenario will never be a realistic scenario because the EU uh, wants to implement complementary measures. And the reason I would like to explain you in a minute. In a minute. Now, if you have these scenarios in mind, it might be very helpful to think a little bit about marginal abatement costs, and in particular, also the CO2 prices, which are consistent with carbon neutrality. And of course, there's a lot of uncertainty about this. Now here, uh, for the 40% target, this was the target before the EU Green Deal, within the UETS, this would imply a reduction of the emissions minus 43%, and the range of the carbon prices within the UETS would be between 30 to 60 euros per ton CO2. Today, uh, the carbon price in the EU ETS system is roughly 40%. It's, it's, it's quite significant. So then there's these other sectors. These are called the European effort sharing regulation. So you should not be too much concerned about all these acronyms. This basically means in the effort sharing regulation, transport, building, uh, heating is included. And for this minus 45%, there would be a carbon price or marginal abatement cost curves between 100 and 200 euros per ton CO2. So you already see there will be an expected price range here. Now, the debate in the EU is, is, is basically uh, uh, how to deal with this. And uh, uh, so this is based on multiple calculations, but what we have calculated here with an integrated assessment model is quite in line what other institutions like the EU and in particular German institution have calculated. So I have to say the EU commission is, is very optimistic about carbon prices, or I should say, they like to highlight low carbon prices for several reasons. Now, let me, let me uh, highlight here now one important component of the debate. 
the current debate is the division of labor between the already existing European emissions trading scheme, which is power sector industry, and all the other sectors, the division of labor. So let's assume now the division of labor is basically based on the current split, so to say. And we uh, impose the minus 55% uh, proportionally to all the sectors. So we, we then end up uh, with a price range in the current ETS between 80 to 150 euros per ton CO2. And outside the ETS in transport building uh, and heating between 350 and 500 euros per ton CO2. You will never see such a number in the current debate. So, and I admit, these are the marginal abatement cost curves without any additional measures. You might, we might be in a position to reduce these carbon prices a little bit, but not too much. But definitely, if you introduce complementary measures, this does not mean you reduce the welfare costs. Uh, you only just hide the welfare costs. Now, if you define the division of labor between th these two sectors according to cost efficiency or cost optimality, which basically means you want to achieve this uh, the 2030 goal uh, uh, in, in a cost minimizing way, this would imply uh, that the ranges of the carbon prices are between 120 to 300 euros per ton CO2. But the most important aspect here is this would require that within the current ETS, which means within industry and the power sector, we would need almost minus 80% compared to the 2005 level, and in the effort sharing regulation, minus 30%. And it is quite obvious why this is the case, because the marginal abatement costs in transport and building are so high, and you have plenty of options in power and in industry. However, this is a, a scenario which will never happen because of political reasons in the EU. Uh, the industry sector and the power sector is advocating strongly that what they say, the transport sector and the building sector should contribute their fair share to this. So a pure cost minimization uh, procedure uh, will not work. Now, this is, this is so to say that the current debate and uh, what are now the options which are uh, in the end available. And here we basically assume that in this scenarios, the rest of the world will follow this carbon neutral pathway. This is a, an assumption which we can debate in the discussion. Of course, and this I would like to highlight here is, uh, this carbon prices uh, uh, are roughly uh, what is required by carbon neutrality. And of course, policymakers like to talk about carbon neutrality they like to talk about uh, emission reduction goals, but they dislike to talk about the carbon prices which are consistent with these goals. And here you can see basically just two aspects here. This uh, increase and this high carbon prices, uh, you have to deal with uh, distributional consequences because there's a disproportionately higher burden of a uniform carbon tax for households in the Eastern member states. And also you need a compensation required within countries uh, last, the last two years in Germany, we had an extensive discussion how this compensating, compensation might work and how to transform uh, a regressive carbon tax uh, into a more uh, progressive carbon tax uh, with, for example, equal per capita recycling. Now, what, what's, what, what are the, the institutional options now? So, of course, the current framework, the status quo, the regulatory uh, uh, scenario is a high risk scenario. It is very unlikely that given the current structure that the minus 55% can be implemented with just a regulatory scenario. From my point of view, the C price scenario where basically carbon prices plays the only role in, in this game is, is only a focal point for the future at its best. So we have to think about the mixed scenario as an intermediate step. And this is the current debate in the EU how this intermediate step should look like. So th there are a few options. Uh, one option is that there will be just one uh, ETS combining the current ETS with the effort sharing regulation sector. And uh, as I told you, this is very unlikely because of the unfavorable division of labor between the different sectors. 
it is more likely that we will implement a second emission trading scheme for transport and building. And I should be a little bit more precise. It's very likely that an upstream scheme would be implemented, which consists of all the fuels, oil, gas, and coal, and then uh, 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 institutional measures to avoid double counting. But this is something which, 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 which could work. However, uh, there is here a, a, an a particular a complicated problem. Policymakers then have to deal with this price, huge price differentials between the current ETS sector and the new emerging emissions trading scheme. And when uh, the traders anticipate there will be at some stage a merger of the two systems, they anticipate this and then the price convergence uh, might uh, happen much more earlier. And therefore, I think uh, a price caller is needed in order to manage uh, this, this transition in, in, a, in a proper way. One large aspect in the EU I would like to highlight, this is this whole issue of negative emissions. And this is not widely discussed. And uh, what we are doing now, we means basically in our institute to think about what are at least reasonable schemes to incentivize uh, negative emissions. And this is a quite interesting debate. Uh, we need this debate. So uh, here you have a, 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 a kind of a, a, let's say, a sketch how the merit order could look like for carbon dioxide removal potentials, the marginal abatement cost curves. It ranges from biochar uh, to the combination of bioenergy and carbon capture and storage. And in particular, direct air capture is an option which would be a quite interesting one. And now people are also talking about large scale deployment of hydrogen and uh, synthetic fuels. For that, you would need uh, CO2, uh, either from biomass or from direct air capture, which is also a quite interesting debate. But this is nothing which can be scaled up now. We have even no pilot projects. But at least uh, this is something uh, which we have to think about because the deployment of uh, removals uh, should start now in order to have them ready. Uh, by 2050 for carbon neutrality, because carbon neutrality is a net concept. And there are a lot of emissions which cannot be uh, reduced and there can only be compensated. Now, let me, uh, let me conclude here. I would say there is a reform opportunity within the EU because of its ambitious targets and uh, regulatory efforts. It is very crucial to avoid uh, turning a forward-looking reform agenda into a status quo preserving regulatory mess. And there's a, a significant likelihood that this will happen. A comprehensive carbon price reform at all levels is a worthwhile endeavor, all by its institutionally very demanding. But I think as an, a two emission trading scheme as an immediate step and a clear definition of a unified emissions trading scheme as a focal point seems to me a reasonable way forward. This requires a dialogue between experts and the policymakers but what's from my point of view quite important is CO2 pricing sends a clear signal that climate policy is taken seriously by, by governments. And what Antonio said in, in his slide is that carbon pricing alone is not enough. You need infrastructure investments and all sorts of things. And I agree with that. I'm not saying carbon pricing is the only uh, game in town, but without carbon pricing, there's a high risk in Europe that all the infrastructure investment will go into the wrong direction. So for me, uh, therefore, CO2 pricing is a necessary condition uh, for all the other uh, uh, policies which uh, are necessary at the European level. So far, so good. Thank you very much. Well, that, that's great. I really appreciate all three um, presentations. L let me uh, just start things off with a, a just, uh, just a question that each of you can uh, perhaps quickly uh, respond to. If you were, uh, well, two questions. First of all, what's your preferred global carbon tax right now? If you had to put one in place, ignoring, uh, well, you can also specify what how it would grow, but uh, Antonio, you said something about six, $6 a ton. I was talking yesterday from our model about $70 a ton. Maybe I got your number wrong, but so it must be higher. And, I think Omar is talking about more like a, a possibly a yep. fewer $300 a ton. So, uh, and Sarah, I want to find out what um, 
And then also, how optimistic do you think we can get this? Uh, let me put it this way. If you're Joe Biden, what would you do to bring the, the world together to move ahead uh, in this direction? So take it away. And then we'll ask the panelists, the other people on the screen here to uh, throw up any questions that they have, and then we'll open it up in general. Go ahead, Antonio. Yeah, on carbon tax, uh, apologies, I was not clear. Uh, uh, at the beginning, uh, a carbon tax between six and $20. Uh, mm -hmm. Six, uh, gradually growing to 2030 at between 10 and 40, and growing to 2050 between 110 and uh, 150. The important thing is to be ex ante announced so everybody understands this and the industry can adapt. In this game, the more you announce, the more credible, the more investment, especially in um, uh, green technology, the less cost that you have exposed. So a gradual increase, uh, and the end is for rich country around 150. So the $6 was for a relatively poor country now. So that's quite slow, low to start with, at least. Uh, yeah. Uh, what do you think, Admar, uh, about that compared to what the EU is saying uh, to do? It seems very different. Yeah, so first of all, if we talk about international carbon taxes, the first thing is we should not think about one global carbon tax. So we should allow a differentiation of carbon prices. So I did a, a paper in December in Nature where we tried to calculate this. So modestly differentiated carbon prices combined with conditional transfers. For example, where we try to give transfers to, to countries who, who wants really to implement the carbon price. Because from my point of view, uh, the, 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 the coal investments in Southeast Asia are really something which are very uh, dangerous, I would say. So if they, if they continue with their investment in coal, so we close the door to a 1.5 and two degree target and even we cannot, uh, this is not consistent with the two degree target. So I think a combination of conditional transfer with reasonable carbon prices in these areas would, would be good. For the EU, you have seen the, the large numbers on carbon neutrality. So I would say uh, uh, 60 euros per ton CO2 within the UETS by 2030 might be, from my point of view, a reasonable number. And we're not how far away. So it's already we are at the, at the 40 euros per ton CO2. If we do it cleverly, uh, I think we could achieve by 2030, roughly with 100 euros per ton CO2, we could achieve the whole thing when, when there are, are sufficient investments. I agree with Antonio. I would, I would think about the price caller, which should be announced in advance. And then we can see what, what will happen. And the emissions trading scheme could help us to, to detect uh, the marginal abatement cost curves. Nobody knows exactly the, the marginal abatement cost curves, in particular in the transport, in the building, and in the heating sector. So that's 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 from my point of view. So roughly, the, the numbers which are quite consistent with the number of Antonio. Uh, Sarah, what about you? So think? I'm going to stay away from the politics of talking about uh, carbon taxes, as you would expect a central banker uh, to do. And I'm going to simplify it and talk about a global shadow price, because then I can ignore all of the distributional uh, consequences. But I do think it's really important that we central bankers talk about what that global shadow price for carbon would need to be in order to drive an orderly transition to net zero, which minimizes economic costs and, and financial risks. That's what we're working on in those scenario analyses, the stress tests that I talked about. And we're working with Otmar and other colleagues who know a lot more about the science of this and bringing our economic analysis uh, to the table and trying to paint a picture of what an orderly uh, transition to net zero might look like, what the global shadow carbon price would be on a forward basis in order to drive the very investments that we have just been uh, talking about that will hopefully mean that the the cost of the transition is lower. Uh, we have some scenarios out there that we have produced uh, as part 
part of the NGFS. They have uh, carbon price pathways in them. Uh, uh, the one that is the orderly transition to net zero has got a hundred dollars by 2030. If I were a planning individual, I would have that in uh, as an input into my investment decisions, knowing that the risks are in uh, one direction only. Okay, let me just uh, throw out one idea that people might not have thought about, which is, um, you know, uh, it sounds like we're talking about a, a slow uh, buildup of this carbon price, which it raises the green paradox effect of, you know, tells these uh, dirty energy producers use it or lose it. And uh, another uh, idea would be to start with a high carbon tax, maybe $100 a ton, and then bring it down through time. Because all we're trying to do here, is, we're not really trying to stop uh, production of dirty uh, burning of, dark, of fossil fuels. We're trying to slow it down. We're trying to uh, just spread it out over time. And uh, so we have a slow burn, not a fast burn. And if you have a high tax followed by a declining tax, uh, you give the energy producers an incentive to delay their burn. So might want to everybody might, might want to think about that. We found in our model that you can get pretty close to similar, it's pretty similar efficiency gains going in that direction relative to uh, to having a, a carbon tax that uh, uh, starts at 70 bucks and then kind of grows with the economy. Anyway, uh, let me open it to, the, um, to other uh, participants, speakers and uh, who are on the screen, any, any uh, Intervention here, Rick, and other. Uh, Antonio, you need to respond. I think also that uh, you have to look at the political sustainability. If you start very high after a few years, you're out of office. And uh, uh, yeah. political constraints are so big that you cannot really start big. Uh, yeah, maybe. I guess you're right. I mean, well, Larry, I think down better. But anyway, go Armin ahead. has a question. Armin, go ahead. To interrupt that. Yeah, hi. Thank you for a very interesting presentation and talks. My question will be towards Otma's talk. I, I've been thinking about the Green Deal in the EU quite a bit, um, trying to see how they address inequality. Now, you had a little slide. It's, you talked a little bit about it on one of your slides when you talked about across countries. But I wonder if you could say anything about within country inequality. You, you hinted at it when you talked about the discussions within Germany. But I'd be interested to hear more about that. Okay, should, should, I, uh, should I respond directly? Yes, uh, please. Yeah. 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 So, there, uh, uh, Aman, you, that's a very interesting question. So, um, one important aspect here, what we have to understand from the political economy, is that the EU Commission has announced they want to have own resources, which basically means an own tax base. And if you look from that angle to the fiscal federalism of the EU, you realize that the EU wants to have uh, revenues from auctioning of the permits in order to use this for repay their debt, for example. So this changes now currently the incentive structure between the commission and, and the member states. And this limits, to a certain extent, the possibility of the member states to come up with reasonable compensation schemes. Uh, and this is something which has to be done with, within, within the national government. So what we have done in Germany, uh, so we worked very hard to convince the government to do an equal per capita recycling. They resisted because uh, they argued that this is not consistent with a Bismarckian welfare state uh, just to, to provide uh, people cash unconditionally. So what we did instead is we reduced a little bit the, the power tax and have increased a little bit the social transfers. In the end, uh, so the, the low income households have now a less burden than the rich households in contrast to a situation where equal per capita recycling would really provide a net benefit, net cash uh, to the poor households. I am really afraid about this because uh, when you think about, uh, so the power sector and the electricity prices, so it's probably for the poor households not unimportant, but less important than transport and heating. And if you have such high prices, so then we member states have to adjust 
their compensation schemes quite dramatically. And I would say we are not prepared to do this because there's at the EU level and within the member states, not an honest debate what how the, the prices will look like. By the way, in Germany, we have implemented for transport and building a second emission trading scheme. It comes in operation at the beginning of this year with a fixed price, and the price will fluck and fluctuate after 2026. So let's see what the prices will be, but uh, definitely, uh, so we will have a, a debate in Germany how to adjust the recycling scheme and the compensation scheme. Mm -hmm. Okay, other, oh, yes, um, Flint, please weigh in. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you to the panelists also. I'm curious if you could speak to um, basically the role of China in all of this, which is now what about a third of global emissions and how you view both the potential for cooperation or spillovers or, or what the relation um, you, you envision or foresee between Chinese policy on climate and cooperation between Western governments. Oh, uh, Barry, Sarah, I can please. I can yeah, have yeah. a go at picking that up from a central banking perspective, if uh, if that's helpful. Again, I'll kind of stay away from the the politics of it. Uh, the one thing that I would say in response was that network for the greening of the financial system that I mentioned that was established three and a half uh, years ago. Um, that had the People's Bank of China as a founder member and all of the work that I described the Bank of England doing that is being replicated in the NGFS uh, is being taken and applied in uh, a Chinese context. Now, of course, they have a particular way of doing uh, things reflecting the political uh, situation uh, there. But as technocrats, I would emphasize that the People's Bank have been a, a le leading the charge on uh, these issues, along with the Bank of England and, and European colleagues. So I am hopeful that uh, these issues are front and, uh, and center of the technocrats mind. And as I say, if you think of people like me as being in control of the, the levers that can help the financial system play a role in supporting a transition. I think there is uh, grounds for hope there uh, for, the, uh, for the Chinese, whilst recognizing, of course, the particular uh, circumstances that they face. What do you guys think of, a, of, of an idea of a policy where you put on increasing tariffs on big emitters, or you say, look, um, here's a schedule of tariffs we're gonna be uh, imposing on your uh, imports for, on imports from uh, from uh, from your country uh, uh, based on your carbon emissions, and it's going to get higher and higher to a point where uh, the U U.S., the EU, Japan, the, de the developed world won't import anything from China unless you're at this level uh, within a few years. Antonio, you was that uh, uh, yeah. also? Yeah. Well, uh, if you have uh, um, uh, domestic carbon tax, you do have, you need a, a border carbon adjustment because both for political and economic reasons. Otherwise you import uh, uh, for obvious reasons, economically self-defeating and politically is even worse. Uh, so uh, now the issue is the impl uh, implementation. WTO admits the border carbon adjustment uh, and the issue is how to implement it. And uh, it, it's very complicated to calculate from input out of table the content of carbon of a good producer abroad, especially if you consider infrastructure. We know that a lot of carbon is related to the infrastructure. And how do you calculate this? Uh, so uh, theoretically, I think it's important. Uh, the implementation will be very, very difficult and complicated. At the same time, uh, a serious border carbon adjustment, which is not an excuse to impose uh, protectionist <laughs> to the back door, will be a powerful um, 
instrument to convince countries which are more reluctant about this to go for it, to, to go for a, a carbon tax domestically. Uh, if, if, if I may, um, I would like to respond first to, to Lind's uh, uh, question on China. I would say, um, in general, I would prefer, to be honest, an international negotiations on climate instead of talking about uh, NDCs, national determined contributions, start to negotiate about, about carbon minimum prices and then to, to try to find a ratchet up process uh, uh, with prices. And, and to a certain extent, for example, we can could provide to some countries some, some kind of transfers to do this. In the case of China, that's not necessary. And they have implemented now a very weak national emission trading scheme, but at some stage that might be a starting point. Regarding the border tax adjustments or the border uh, adjustment, carbon border adjustment mechanisms, um, here I would like to say the following. So what do we intend to achieve with such a mechanism? And my proposal would be we should achieve that, for example, in the case of Europe, that European industry, steel industry, uh, energy intensive industry, which is exposed to international competition, should not have a disadvantage because Europe has a, a, a carbon tax. But this, this kind of, of car, uh, carbon border tax uh, mechanisms are not good uh, in order to, to penalize other countries or to, to, to uh, basically to, 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 to try to incentivize to, to, to join a club. I would prefer I would prefer a club, but the club should, should negotiate on, on, on carbon prices and internal benefits. And for example, when we talk about uh, carbon border adjustments, I think we should tax in a very simple way products, for example, from China, but not based on their emissions, but based on benchmark emissions in Europe, just to protect the, the European industry. And we should not try to calculate the carbon content uh, from, of products from China. This is a hopeless task from my point of view. We need for a few industries which are ex energy intensive and exposed to international competition, some kind of protection. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't rely too much on, on, on this mechanism. I would rely much more on, on, on try to, uh, to cooperate uh, with the US and try to cooperate with China and a few other smaller Southeast Asian countries because the cooperation among them is important because here is the, the big beef of, of the emissions in, in the next 10 years. And, and here we have to talk about one important aspect and this is coal. Well, let me, uh, yeah, um, sorry. Uh... Francesco. Yeah, hi. Can, can I ask, uh, sorry, I'm going to sound incredibly naive, but can I ask for help in understanding this China issue? I'm very puzzled about it. I, I'm, in my mind, no, uh, no rational political leader fails to understand that, um, you know, some significant cost of carbon emission should be somehow brought into existence. Uh, admittedly, not all political leaders in recent years have been fully rational, but I don't think anyone thinks that Chinese leadership is not rational. The, this is all the more so when you account for a very large share of worldwide emissions. And I thought that the explanation for um, lack of uh, more aggressive action usually is in the political economy and political constraints at the domestic level that prevents leader, leaders to implement something closer to the optimal policy. And if there is one leader that is less constrained than others, it's, it's China, I, I, I thought. So why I, I'm, I'm puzzled that we are worrying about China. China should be leading uh, in, in, this, in this area. And, um, and, and, and governments in countries that are more, where there are many more political veto players, uh, the ones who, uh, who struggle. So I'm I'm just confused uh, of, of why we are we are so worried about China not doing the right thing. Um, well, I mean, if they're putting out thirty percent of the world's emission, I don't know how what fr fraction the U.S. is putting out. But uh, both countries are doing. Sounds like we're doing the wrong thing, and we need to be penalized. 
you know, I think I think the um, one aspect of 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 doing something dramatic like saying, look, we're going to phase in tariffs on you on emitters. You know, even if it's just Switzerland did this. You know, Swiss, Switzerland says you can't have an air conditioner in your home. They're taking this extremely serious, even though they can't impact the world's emission. They're so small, but by making an example, setting an example, they can have an impact. So you have, um, if you have, the more we get everybody um, to make this a big deal, um, to say, look, if you're going to continue to admit to uh, emit carbon, we're going to uh, tax you at a higher rate on your imports, all your imports, so we don't have to deal with the specific, the details of, uh, we're just going to not deal with you economically. And if the US and the EU did that together in the UK, that would have a big impact on China. And then we'd expect China, the UK, and the EU to say the same thing to the US. So now we have collectively this kind of, um, unless everybody gets into line, consent, I, you know, threat, but it's also um, a uh, kind of a sea change in thinking. If you look at the US, for example, right now, we have G General Motors uh, CEO saying they're going to go completely uh, out of producing gas fired engines in about 10, 15 years. That's an enormous sea change. I mean, this is to say we're only going to produce electric cars. Uh, and other, uh, you know, CEOs are realizing that unless you're um, doing something dramatic on the clean energy front, even if you're not uh, producing cars, you're just in, just have a don't have a clean building. Uh, it's uh, just not going to make you look good as a CEO that this is kind of part of your job description of being environmentally conscious. I think uh, we can't understate the non-economic aspect of of just the uh, kind of uh, uh, blowback from from countries uh, talking about this and threatening even if they can't follow through to do something to get everybody kind of conscious to raise people's consciousness and government leaders consciousness about so I would say the next Paris meeting accord should be in Moscow it should be the Moscow Accord because that will put pressure on the Russians to take the lead uh, and to show everybody that this is uh, Russia is going to actually show the way. Uh, I think we have to think very much out of the box beyond where we are, but uh, any feedback? We also, uh, Gabby, do you have any questions? No, no, could, I, could I make one comment to Francesco uh, on, on the constraint? Um, I'm not an expert. I, I know a, a little bit about China, but I'm not, I, I don't claim I'm an expert in China. But I think the assumption that the political leadership is not constrained is, is not a good assumption. And the constraint comes from the regions. And there's a huge regional conflict within China. And this is a huge constraint for the political leadership. And, 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 and if you think about this uh, national emission trading scheme, which they have implemented, you immediately see that this national scheme is much weaker than all the regional regulations. And this has a lot to do with, with distributional consequences with, with, within China. And they have to resolve basically the, the, same, the same problem, probably with a little bit more power of the central government. And there is one question in the chat, which is very much related at the EU. And the question here is that there is this, in the EU, this effort sharing re regulation scheme, which would allow the member states to solve some of the distributional consequences because then they can buy uh, permits from other governments where they cannot fulfill it. And this is a very delicate thing. And, and thank you very much for this question because I hide this in my presentation because I thought it is too complicated. So outside uh, this uh, EETS, there is, there is not a cap, a global cap for the EU, but there are allocated targets for each member states. And the question is, what should happen with this effort sharing regulation when the targets will become tighter? And, and from my point of view, the best way would be to define a European wide gap and to use this effort sharing regulation as a kind of a, uh, let's say, a mathematical formula to allocate the initial endowments in this scheme. So this, this would be, from my point of view, the best way, and then to provide uh, and, and to, to, to use this as a, as a kind of a, of a transfer mechanism. 
And this is something we will we will know more about this in June when the commission makes a proposal here. But but uh, in the end, uh, the delicate thing is, so with the current effort sharing regulation, they, they will never achieve the minus 55% target. So, and, and the question is how they deal again with the distributional consequences. And my proposal would be define a cap, use the Ashford sharing regulation as the starting point uh, to do a, an initial endowment of, uh, of, of, of the allocations. Let's see what, what, what will happen. But this is again, the same, the, the same constraint, almost the same constraint like, like in China. It's, it's all about the EU member states and, and how to sort out these distributional issues. Alex, uh, you had a question, I think. Yeah, I actually have a question also related to distribution, but within distribution, so compensating policies. So should the EU member states or other countries as well, or Germany in particular, take up more debt, thinking of, of Larry's uh, paper in order to finance uh, compensation schemes in order to be able to implement the higher carbon taxes? Should, another, another way to put this is, uh, should we be bribing current generations uh, to accept a carbon tax, a significant one, by cutting their other taxes, running deficits, leaving the bill for future generations who will be better off because of uh, the better climate? So we get a win-win situation. Uh, it's hard to, uh, I would think, for anybody to disagree with that. So maybe that's where we have to start, you know, kind of focusing our attention on win-win solutions. But Anyway, why don't we have each of the, uh, the panelists here, Sarah, starting with you, respond to the idea of a win-win. Of, uh, so I'm well outside my area of expertise on uh, on this. I'm a, a central banker who uh, tries to tries to think about aggregates in uh, in general. But do I agree with the underlying point, which is what it will help? is to identify situations and ways of spreading the costs that both minimize the costs and create win-win uh, environments. So I very much agree with that, Larry, is, as you said, kind of it's hard to disagree with. But the other thing I would come back to is the importance of forward climate policy as a way of trying to direct investment and spur innovation so that the costs are minimized. I think that is at least as important a way uh, through as thinking about uh, those win-win aspects. Okay, and uh, uh, Antonio, any response? Oh, you're pretty. Uh, yeah. I think it depends very much on the overall fiscal situation. Uh, and so uh, it's important to bribe the current generations, but uh, it, uh, it depends on the overall fiscal. In some countries in Europe, I don't know if there is enough space at this moment. Uh, the other issue is that uh, uh, we stress a lot in our work in the, as I mentioned, the weird chapter of October, the importance of fee baits just to compensate the groups which are more at, at risk. My impression is that the horizontal is more important than the, how to say, intergenerational aspect of uh, for political acceptance. Mm -hmm. Simply because current, current people vote while future people vote less. And so uh, it's... Uh, so I would stress this as a main issue. On Francesco, given, uh, I think that the, even if the Chinese leadership had the complete control uh, that they don't have on their, on their country, uh, as uh, Otmar was suggesting, there is the issue of externality always in the sense that uh, if you, uh, you don't internalize externality, you impose on the rest of the world. No government does it. Uh, uh, rational government. Oh. Yes. And uh, Admar, uh, any? Um, uh, we're getting getting close to the end here, but any more uh, thoughts about? Would you be up for um, running large deficits in order to bribe current generations to uh, adopt a carbon tax? 
I, I would say this will be the most likely outcome in Germany because we have suspended the Schwarze Null. I don't know what this in the black zero, which basically means no additional debt. So this is suspended. And after 2026, we will see relatively high carbon prices in our national emission trading scheme in very sensitive sectors, transport, heating, and building. And I think uh, debt will be increased. And part of this uh, increased debt has to be used uh, to provide compensation for, for also for the, for, the, for the current generation to deal with this. So in one way or another, we will have, we will see increasing carbon prices and we will see increasing debt. So it's probably not, not sold in such a way what, what you said, it's a, in a kind of a social contract way, but as an unintentional outcome, this probably is, will, will be very likely the case. Right. Uh, how about uh, Rick and Francesco, any final um, policy advice and, and also uh, we have uh, any, anyone else? You, you, I think you have a question in the chat. Maybe you should, you should leave the uh, okay, let's go. Okay. So there's a question. I'm happy to take that um, uh, mm -hmm. if you'd like, Larry. Go ahead, Rikavi. Uh So, should we practice what we preach? Is uh, the short version of the, uh, the question in the chat, I think. Should we take account of the financial risk from climate change in how we manage our balance sheet? And should we, in addition, think about how we can use our balance sheet to uh, help support an orderly transition to net zero. As put, the answer to those questions is uh, obviously yes. And we are indeed trying uh, to do so. As I said earlier, as of uh, the budget, we now have uh, the political uh, uh, um, um, cover to do so. Uh, we have got uh, in our MPC uh, remit, the uh, uh, expectation that we should take uh, the transition to net zero into account. When thinking about our balance sheet, uh, do remember that the vast majority of the quantitative easing that we do is uh, invested in gilt. That's because those are the most liquid uh, largest assets that there are. Uh, out there and is able to provide monetary stimulus as, uh, as needed. But we do have a small corporate bond portfolio, uh, 20 billion uh, pounds at the, at the moment. And what we are actively looking at is how we in our management of that portfolio can simultaneously remain market neutral, but try and have a climate adjusted market neutral that speaks to the sorts of uh, uh, tilts or exclusions that might encourage the financial system to finance an orderly transition to net zero. And we're very much approaching that task, thinking, well, if we did that and the whole of the financial system copied us, would it drive the sorts of uh, behaviors that we need to see? if we are to get that orderly transition. So short answer, yes, you'll hear more from us in Q2. Uh, we'll hope to uh, be in a position to then execute uh, that by the end of the year uh, so that when COP happens, uh, we are indeed practicing what we're preaching. But um, if I might just add one final comment, um, this is not easy or straightforward uh, to do. Uh, so um, uh, that's why we're putting our, we will put our thoughts out uh, for people to comment on. Great. Larry, back to you. Okay, I wanna thank all three panelists for an excellent uh, discussion and, and I'm gonna leave it to Alex to wrap things up. Okay, Alex, okay. any final thoughts? Uh, no final thoughts from my side, just a final thanks. Thanks a lot for everybody who came to the conference and participated. And thanks a lot for especially the three to four panelists in the for the policy panel. And thanks very much for the fruitful discussion that we had. And what else can I say? I hope that we continue discussing about these very important issues. And maybe Francesco, Rick, do you also want to say some final words? I wouldn't mind seeing something like like let's meet again, but then over a gin and tonic and a and a proper beer. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and maybe there will be an opportunity because 
Uh, because Alex and uh, Francesca and I will, will try to put forward a more policy oriented conference uh, if, uh, you know, kind of uh, supporting the COP26. So, so hopefully we see some of you there as well, but, uh, but, uh, but uh, that's being organized as we speak or as soon as this is finished. So hopefully for some of us, we'll, we will meet again over gin and tonic. Yeah, right. hopefully. Good. Okay. That, that's the perfect last words for closing of a conference. All good. And stay healthy, everybody. Yeah. yeah. Thanks a lot.